Uh, hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. Uh, I'm your host, Lisa, and I'm here today with my guest, Venkat. Hey, Lisa. Welcome to Scorpio Season. I'm here with hey. my guest, Lisa. Hey, so Venkat, what are we talking about today? What letter are we on? We are on R. And uh, what is your R snack? Oh, my R snack today is I have uh, rice crackers that I'm eating. Ah, rice crackers. Okay. Not bad. I ended up doing three things. So I have raspberries, mm. cut up pieces of radish, and dark russet potato chips. So this I felt, I started with dark russet potato chips, but then I remember that I'd already used it for D. And then it also felt a little bit like cheating because most potato we eat is in fact russet. So I added uh, raspberries and radish. I see. It's kind of like an R salad, crunchy R mm. salad. Cool. Yeah. Mm, I definitely did better this week. Um, so today on our list, we've got five things to talk about. Um, should we start with the first one? It's the uh, red pills. Red pills. Which, um, Are you red pills? I don't know. I mean, I definitely think I've gone through periods in my life where I like feel like I swallowed a pill and there's no one swallowing it. Um, I think like... Should we talk about the first time that you think you were red-pilled? Venkat, do you think you've ever been red-pilled? No, I, I don't think I've ever been red-pilled. Uh, but I've done a lot of red-pilling of others. And um, <laughs> we should define our terms a little bit, though, because okay, um, yeah. uh, the metaphor for the red pill came from the Matrix movie, right? The red pill versus the blue pill. And today, I think it means at least two things. There may be more there is the generic meaning of um, sort of losing a false consciousness and becoming sort of like, you know, aware of um, some underlying reality. So that's the sort of general meaning. And then yeah. the specific meaning of being red pilled into a particular community, namely the sort of right wing uh, incel uh, uh, men's rights kind of movement. And I think that's the Reddit, subreddit R red pill. So that's specific to that meaning, right? Yeah. And uh, I should add another kind of, um, ironic bit of context that uh, I think people who talk about this recognize, but people who are outside the Twitter world don't often recognize, which is that red pill has become like this men's rights motif, but at the same time, the Wachowski uh, sisters used to be the Wachowski brothers. So it's, I find it really ironic. And I think lots of people have commented on the ir irony that red pill today means one thing, but the term comes from people who mean exact opposite thing but anyway so i'm mostly interested in red pilling as a generic concept of like um, breaking tearing away a false consciousness so is that how you think of it too yeah that's that's basically the only way i really think of it i hadn't realized that it had meant um had been co-opted or like sort of uh colonized i should say so much by the men's rights movements i wasn't aware of that um oh yeah it's actually, totally yeah actually the the is it weinstein sisters um no which one were you talking about? Wachowski. The sorry, the Wachowski, the Wachowski <laughs> sisters. Um, they yeah. they're the ones behind the Matrix, the movie series, right? Yes. Yeah. So I I looked them up. I think like you know I watched the Matrix when it came out. Um, I was like in gosh, I was like middle school. Um. And uh, <laughs> like a few, you know, I haven't really thought about it since then. And then maybe within the last year or two, I went to go look it up again and really thought I was in one of those like, you know, like alternate universes. And like they're like people use like the Berenstein Bears, the way that you spell it is like evidence that we like live in a different time because everyone and their mother remembers it being spelled a different way. The first time I saw, I, I, was made to realize that the uh, Wachowski brothers had become the Wachowski sisters I like had this moment of like wait when I was a kid it was the brothers like did I end up in a different timeline like what <laughs> happened like what, like oh my goodness what has happened um and then it was like no they just made they transitioned and I was like that's okay that that makes sense it's not actually a different timeline timeline's <laughs> the same there was just like a, a movement in 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 their lives between like now and then anyways um, but yeah, but so red pill movements, I think, so I think, I think my first, first one I can remember was in college. I read a book. It was a book. I read a book um, called Ishmael by this man named Daniel Quinn. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and he would say, well, okay, maybe there's two and they're all around. So all, I feel like all of my early red pill memories, um, are biblical. Um, and I, so I was raised because I was raised as a, like, I grew up in a very like Christian household. Mm-hmm. Like my, my mom is very religious. I don't actually, I'm, I'd have to, I don't know how to qualify that, but my mom's a religious person. She like attends church. Um, we grew up Lutheran though, which is kind of one of the more, I like to think of it as like practical, pragmatic, like, um, mm-hmm. it's like, it's not a uh, Protestantism. I feel like you can get like really deep, like there's like Baptists are like way more kind of cultish crazy. Whereas like Lutherans are just kind of like, it's very like German. Um, well, Lutherans were the original, um, Protestant, Protestant sect, right? Yeah. And then it got more and more radical. You got the Calvinists and then eventually end up at the Southern Baptists in the United States. Yeah, I think that's mm-hmm. true. Um, and like my, my, my mom's side of the family is like old school German. So I, I just, I don't, I don't know if this is true of the narrative I tell myself in my head about our religious like predilection is that we're just like old stock German Lutherans. That's just like how that goes. But I could be wrong about that. Anyways, um, I grew up, I grew up religious. Um, and so part of growing up religious is that like, that is the easiest thing to get red pilled about, if that makes sense. Like, it's just easy uh-huh. for someone to like, that's a narrative that you have that you like believe in. And so it's like, I don't know if easy is the right word for it, but that is like the most obvious thing to be like, really like a false consciousness too. Um, the, so Ishmael actually does this in a really fun and interesting way. Um, <laughs> it's a reinterpretation of where the stories that are Genesis come from. Um, and the, the book style itself is really fun. It's done with like a man having a, com- so it's like a conversation. So it's almost like semi-Socratic. And then it's two people having a conversation, telling each other, like asking questions and stuff back and forth. But one of the people is a gorilla. Um, so it's like a gorilla. It's interesting that you said two people and one of the people is a gorilla. Yeah. I would just have said a person and a gorilla, but we should talk about person with some time. Yeah. yeah, I wanted you to think it was one thing and then it's like reveal it to be something else at the end. Um, well, I've read the book, but um, it's a fun reveal for um, people who haven't heard of the book. But yeah, right. I remember it very well. I read it in college. Yeah, exactly. I read it in college. Actually, I read it while I was on vacation in college at a friend's place. They had it and I spent the whole afternoon just like on the sofa at their place, their grandma's house in Houston reading this book. Um, it's the kind of friend I am. Come over to your house and read your books. Um, <laughs> yeah, I remember the, it, it, if I remember correctly, it reinterprets the uh, story of Cain and Abel as sort of an allegory for agriculture versus nomads or something right yeah takers and leavers takers and leavers yeah 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 but it's a completely it's like very i found it incredibly compelling and i love how it's like the i love how it's like these like certain elements of like early genesis stories are actually a um absorption of like a culture that like the um the farmer culture basically like killed and like drove off the land but their stories survived as like things that got um incorporated into biblical stories so like anyways his idea is that you can go through early bible and kind of like it's it's kind of got like two different perspectives of how the world is and you can trace that to this like basically the dominant farmer culture eating the um and driving out the nomadic cultures Mm -hmm. interesting Uh, i think ishmael actually has two red pills, not just one. So there's that red pill. Uh, but since I wasn't religious, let alone Christian religious, uh, mm-hmm. it, that wasn't, it, it was kind of an interesting reframe for me, the Cain and Abel story, but it, it didn't particularly upend anything for me. But the one I remember from that book was uh, the gorilla asks the human to tell the story of evolution. And the you know, human tells the story in sort of the typical high school or like middle school way, which is, you know, there was first the amoeba and then it became reptiles, blah, blah, blah. And then there were humans. And uh, the gorilla tells uh, sort of, I think ironically tells the story as blah, blah, blah. And then there were gorillas. And it sort of red pilled me from sort of the naive linear uh, ascent of humans as the culmination of evolution, version of evolution. And it got me thinking hard about evolution as this kind of random walk optimization process in like a random landscape and it doesn't really mean anything that one species is surviving and another species is going extinct at any given time so that was a powerful 
um, I guess, small red pill for me. Like I haven't had like true red pills of the sort that people seem to go through on Twitter very publicly these days, which is like, you know, somebody who's like, who was like super communist suddenly reads, uh, uh, I don't know, some Austrian economics and gets red pilled into extreme right wing or something like that, right? So there's this huge shifts that people have that they tend to call right pill or red pilled. I haven't had those. Oh, but like I said, um, I think I've been responsible for red pilling a few people. More than a few people have described uh, uh, my series, The Gervais Principle, as being red pilled about the, uh, you know, what's really going on with office politics. So I find that kind of funny because it's like, I think one of the things that makes red pills interesting is for somebody who sort of provides the red pill, it can be kind of a very slow, dawning, growing realization that the world is a certain way, right? Like, yeah. because you're doing the thinking yourself, it's kind of a slow, laborious process. You sort of strip away one small delusion at a time. And before you know it, you're at the other end and you're like, hey, I've completely turned my thinking around 180 degrees. But it happens so slowly you don't notice. And then you write it as a blog post or a book and somebody else gets the whole benefit of like several years of thinking in like an hour. And then for yeah. them, it's like a step function change. If you've done it well and there's a legitimate sort of uh, uh, delusion removal going on there. Yeah. I mean, so these people that come to you and tell you that they've been red pilled or like that their device principle was an effective red pill for them. Where would you place them in the pyramid? Do you think that they all come from the same place in the pyramid or are they like different locations? Uh, it's well, I mean, the pyramid sort of, already posits that the top level, the sociopaths are kind of post red pilling. They see the world as it is. So only mm -hmm. the other two are candidates, right? Clueless and yeah. um, losers. And mostly people who've told me that they've been red pilled are people who sort of self identify as clueless. Like for them, mm -hmm. it's like a literal stripping away of what they thought the organization was like and what it actually turns out to be like. Yeah, so, that's funny. So you're cluing oh, in yeah. clueless, Venkat. <laughs> I should mention that on the Reddit, our red pill, the men's rights thing, somebody oh, pointed okay. out that I think uh, the Gervais principle is listed as one of their recommended reading links, which kind of cracks me up. That's amazing. That's really yeah. fun. I actually I read the Gervais one, principle while I was working at Etsy. Someone made it, it circulated <laughs> at Etsy and it was like, I think, because it's a couple posts, I think I just read the first long one. Yeah, it's actually six posts and now it's an ebook. So uh, I kind of like dragged it on and milked it for all it was worth because the office, the show was going on at that time. I wrote I part one in 2009, somewhere around the third or fourth season. But then I wrote like one part every year or so until 2012 when the show ended. So it was kind of a fun like live blog, I guess, of the show. It sounds like it. That's fine. Yeah. Anyway, so that's Red Pills. Yeah. All right. Uh, what are we talking about next? Next, okay, so you added this to the spine cat. I'm hoping you can explain what it means because it's not super obvious looking at it. You have resentment and resentment. Ah, uh, yes. So that's actually a, a good sort of uh, continuation of the red pill topic, the specialized sense of the term as it's used by like the men's rights movements and things like that, which tend to lean right wing in the way we understand it today and have a lot of the uh, so-called incel movement, the involuntary celibate movement, you know, mm -hmm. That entire crowd is um, in the red pill corner or they self-identify as red pill. And there's a strong overlap with um, Trump supporters. And uh, when you talk about that kind of mass movement, um, the second of the two terms I put down was sentiment. That's sort of a political science term for the general feeling of um, class-based inferiority or being the target of contempt by an elite and that boils up into anger and revolutionary energy, right? So that's resentment okay. in the political sense. Whereas resentment is just a much more individual personal feeling. Like you might resent a coworker at work for like taking credit for your work or things like that. So resentment is sort of the personal feeling and resentment is sort of the large class-based identity feeling, but they are kind of like I would put them next to each other on sort of the emotional spectrum. They're kind of similar emotions. Okay. But, uh, yeah. So I think we have a lot of both right now, resentment and resentment. So I've heard that, and I don't, I can't remember where I heard this. So um, 
I might be wrong about it, but my understanding of like class-based resentment is that it tends to really show up in societies where a certain a class of people had a privilege or a right or like were more well off than they were pretty well off and then they lose something. So like let's say that there was like everyone had pensions and then you take the pensions away. That is the probably the highest likely case that resentment will erupt into will develop one resentment will develop one and then two that that'll erupt into some amount of like political upheaval or revolution um so kind of what we're going through i would say right now in the united states with like i really think that this whole um i don't have hard evidence for it but i think um I think that what we're going to see is a lot of kind of what happened during the Great Depression is that the middle class and like the barely hanging on classes are going to get pushed farther down in terms of like economic, um, like they're the ones who are going to get hit the hardest by this economic downturn and people who already had money or have money or have decent jobs are just going to like, your ability to just like stay kind of steady where you are is actually going to mean that you're in an upper class, whereas people that like aren't able to hang on are just going to like kind of not like fall off a cliff exactly, but um, yeah, it's it's downward mobility. In fact, um, yeah. if it falls off a cliff, it feels like chronic. I mean, um, acute trauma with an explanation. Like you know, if it falls mm-hmm. off a cliff very suddenly, you'll probably attribute it to some external cause. But if it happens gradually, and uh, we should talk yeah. about examples of this. But I want to quickly point out since you brought up the Great Depression, um, I think one of the best sets of portraits of uh, resentment is some of the characters in Tennessee Williams plays, uh, like in Streetcar Named Desire. Have you ever watched that? No. Oh, so th- this is uh, so all of his plays are about this phenomenon where there's like this class that used to have something and it's sort of gently downwardly mobile and slowly getting more and more resentful and resentful, I guess, of um, the people who are still better off. And uh, you kind of see the portrayal um, really well because in A Streetcar Named Desire, uh, I forget the name of the lead um, Blanche, character. Right? Uh, mm-hmm. Blanche? The Blanche is the woman, the lead male character. He's like a study in resentment and he sort of takes it out on his sister-in-law Blanche, Blanche Dubois, um, it, as a result of what he's feeling. So he's out of work. He's like, he's got a lot of class anger pent up here. He's abusive towards his wife and abusive towards his sister-in-law. So yeah, uh, Tennessee Williams plays are full of um, resentment. And I think the modern version, I think we have both left and right wing. So, they, and they actually have a little crossover. Like they used to be called Reagan Republicans, I think in the early eighties when all the deregulation actually created the class, like they had these secure jobs, it went away and they switched from being Democrats to Republicans. And that's the class that's, I would say, Trumpist now. And on the left, I think you have a similar class, which is uh, often like liberal arts educated um, college kids uh, who came of age during the Great Recession. And they came of age, like they grew up in the 90s thinking they would have a great life. And they ended up coming of age in a shitty decade. Uh, You're kind of in that um, cohort, right? Um, Yeah, so a lot of your classmates must have gone through this where they expected a lot and then didn't get good jobs and ended up in this sort of resentful leftist uh, mode. So you have both Bernie and Trump left and right resentment fueled movements coming out of this, right? Yeah, I don't think any of my specific friends fell into that. Um, what year did you graduate? I graduated from college in 2010. Okay, so that would have been at the sort of almost the bottom of the recession, right? The trough. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Okay, so you, I think you, your classmates might have been a better set, but uh, mm-hmm. one of the things I've heard said is the, the entire culture war, the left side of it, the so, uh, social justice warrior crowd, uh, one explanation I've heard is they were all liberal arts and humanities uh, majors who graduated in like 2008 to 12 and mm-hmm. couldn't really find jobs and ended up becoming like professional culture warriors with like, you know, really good at clickbait, really good at like starting outreach cycles on Twitter, working for like Gawker and sites like that. So there's almost like a direct link between the Great Recession and at least one side of the culture war. The other side from the 80s, it's really like, the 80s deregulation era created the Trumpist right, and the mm-hmm. 2009 recession created the social justice left. And we're seeing the collision of the two mass movements today. I like that as a theory. I don't, 
I don't really, yeah. I mean, through my personal experience, like just personal people I know, I don't know anyone that ended up like that, but it probably says more <laughs> about my social circles than um, the truth Probably. I think this would, you went to school in Texas, right? So this would be largely blue city coastal. Uh, oh, kind of, uh, yeah, no, we yeah. don't, none of us ended up, nope, that's not a thing Texans did. <laughs> Yeah, if they did, they probably went to Yale or some other college on the coast and got radicalized there. But yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, in terms of backing up this theory, it kind of fits both what you said earlier, that they have to have been downwardly mobile and lose something as a class, either expectations or concrete assets they had. And it fits the theory in, uh, have you read Eric Hoffer's uh, True Believer? No. So that's the classic on this subject, 1945 or something. So yeah, he does a whole theory of... Uh, how mass movements form out of resentment, usually it's a downwardly mobile class. It's not the poorest of the poor or the most wretched people who end up being revolutionaries. It's one or two classes above who kind of have enough that they know what they don't have. And they yeah. tend to start these revolutions. Wait, what was the author you said, Eric Hoffman? Eric, Eric Hoffer, H-O-F-F-E-R, Eric Hoffer, uh, the true believer. It's like, yeah, the original classic on mass movements. I think I have read that. Okay. Yeah. Was he the longshoreman? Like the guy, he was like famous for being a longshoreman who like went to the library. He lived in SF and like. Could be. I don't remember that being the backstory, but timing is right. They used to be longshoremen back then. Yeah. But, um... I don't know. Because I read some of his stuff and I, my impression on Eric Hopper, if I'm thinking of the same person, um, was that a lot of his stuff felt cribbed from Hannah Arendt stuff. Which I don't know if that's true. Maybe they were like writing at the same time. The timing would be off. I think Hannah Arendt, yeah, could be, yeah. There was some contemporary stuff. But yeah, there's a lot of resonance and overlap between the two. So yeah, we should think, yeah. look up that connection and uh, explore it another time if we can. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, but, or it could just be like shared cause because the 1940s had so much of that all over the world that everybody was looking at the same evidence and might have reached similar conclusions. Which is cool, right? I feel like that's a lot like, so like last time we talked about quantum, but we didn't really talk too much about quantum mechanics. But one of my favorite, one of my favorite things that I learned, at least from looking at studying the history of like the quantum stuff is that like the, there were like two or three different theories about how quantum, like two or three different sets of equations that people came up with that um, one of the big things Feynman, I think he had a couple of collaborators ended up doing is proving that all these two different ways of looking at the same stuff were equal, um, which is that like you can go out in the world and see phenomena and come up with like accurate representations of them that describe the same thing as someone else's accurate representations of them. And like, they're actually the you know they're describing the same thing in different terms and I think that happens oh, a yeah. lot and I think that happens so much in the liberal arts and like it's a lot harder to like there's no like math equations that you can go and like end up like equating to each other and showing how they're like exactly equal um because that's not like the ground truth for a lot of liberal arts stuff but I think that like there are so many philosophers out there that I feel like come up with the same freaking understandings the way that they, they just like end up constructing their own vocabulary sets so that it's such that like you and me could talk about these different guys using the, the, their own different terminology and there's like no one's done like a reconciliation of like all these things. Um, I think that's kind of true but it's like Often when you see such a pattern in um, the liberal arts, it tends to be, it, it's in the best cases, it's really deep and good. Like they've like both spotted very subtle patterns that seem to line up with each other. Like I think uh, Hannah Arendt and um, Eric Hoffer both have very sort of subtle accounts of um, mass movements and um, radicalization. So that would be a good example. But a lot of the time when I see that kind of stuff, it tends to be like very shallow, kind of uh, isomorphism, so to speak. So it's not something like, you know, a lambda calculus equal to Turing machine. So that would be a very, very deep kind of two things are the same thing result, right? And math and uh, science tend to have a lot of those really deep equivalences. Like uh, one of my favorites is in fact, inertial gravity equal to, or inertial mass equal to gravitational mass. Like it's so obvious to us now, but it actually had to be thought through and proved that you know, the mass that acts when you fall in a gravitational field is the same thing that resists when you try to push it, right? So those are deep equivalences. Whereas liberal arts, often when I look at something, it's like so shallow, like, you know, 
history goes in cycles of creative destruction. I mean, that's such a vacuous statement to make. It's like obviously true. Is and that, no, but is that is that is that from what's his name? Um, is that Hegelian? It's, is that the that's what I mean. Exactly. There's like so many people who said basically that Tony no, okay. has said that Hegel yeah. has said that. Um, uh, Joseph uh, Schumpeter, who did the economics version, has said that. It's like yeah. there's a million people who said this. <laughs> so it's like you don't, don't get credit yeah, for just Schumpeter that. say it because okay. So I read this great thing from Vablin, um, who's my new favorite person ever. Um, Vablin's like this economic anthropologist, basically, who's writing it like around the 1900s. He's most famous for his theory on the leisure class. Um, which I've decided is actually a, so he also wrote this like kind of short thing on Marx where he basically does like a criti criticism of Marxism. Um, and I think that he meant, so I think, anyways, what's my point? Oh, my point is that Veblen is actually a Darwinist. He's like a big into Darwinism. He's like, Darwinism mm -hmm. is clearly the correct way about how the world works. And he says that the problem with Marx, he's like, okay, so Marx in and of himself, and I think this is actually, this leads, I think, into our next point, rightness, correctness. Um, but like, um, the, um, basically, he was saying that um, when Marx's like theories like of how economics work are flawless. Like his logical system that he has built is very good. The problem with Marx, according to Veblen, is that the Marxist theory is built on top of this understanding of how the world works. It's based on Hegel's understanding of dialectical materialism or dialectics, which is how the world evolves. But um, Veblen says the problem is that the world isn't like that. It's Darwinist. There is no like great endpoint that we're headed to, which is what Hegel wants to say that everything's uh -huh. like progressing towards this beautiful radical future, and that's what Marx put his materialism on top of. But Veblen's like no, and it's like you were saying earlier. The problem with um, like, you know, the gorilla is standing there and saying, well, I was the product of evolution. Um, there is no guarantee in evolution. So like Marxism is, is a very correct theory built on top of the very incorrect reality of how the world works. That's, that's a nice connection, by the way, to the starting gorilla thing we were talking about. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's like Marxist analysis, I think, I would give it a little bit more credit than that. Yes, it's built on the shaky foundations of an incorrect understanding of uh, what evolution is. But then, so is every other political uh, science theory, not just Marxism, but, you know, Whig history and lots of anything that's uh, historicist. So Karl Popper yeah. had the thing about historicist ways of telling history as if history has a tendency to progress towards a particular end. We talked about progress studies a couple of um, episodes back, right? So any story of history that says, you're going to greater and greater progress and whatever in a particular direction. It's kind of wrong, but, but not necessarily because it's built on Darwinian foundations. I think you could make an independent case for historicist narratives that don't rest on Darwinist uh, thinking. But since Darwinism is actually such a good description of the way the world works, it would be nice to build it on top of that. But if you try to do that, you run into the reality that Darwinism is not survival of the fittest. It's kind of like a mediocre running around in a you know a noisy global optimization thing where nobody is like permanently ahead, right? So I love that view of, uh, I, I should mention, there's a great book on uh, uh, survival of the most mediocre. Um, uh, I've written about it somewhere, but it's a good book on, evolution viewed from the perspective of um, mediocrity. I, I don't want to go down that bunny trail uh, right now. Uh, but uh, yeah, Veblen, uh, he's one of my favorite authors too. And I just posted a link in the chat. To, yeah, it's, uh, he does another interesting, uh, for me, Veblen was another uh, red pill. So I wrote this post, I think back in uh, 2011, but the red pill for me reading Theory of the Leisure Class was, we are so used to viewing civilization from the point of view of like settled civilizational cores, like, you know, Rome or um, Imperial China, that we don't realize yeah. that there's an alternate way of looking at um, world history, which is from the point of view of the barbarians who periodically come from the margins and invade settled societies, right? So yes. in a way, this is another version of uh, the Ishmael uh, taker-lever dichotomy, except mm. in this version, 
in this sort of second red pill, you could say that the barbarians come out looking uh, much stronger. It's like, yes, it's taker versus lever, but um, actually the barbarian nomads are the more powerful entity. So th that was my point in this blog post. So that's actually a red pill on top of a red pill, double <laughs> red pill. A double red pill. As like maroon pill, I don't know. Pills have colors, I hear. I think that's um, already taken. I, I saw this chart somewhere of um, all sorts of different colored pills and people have claimed every damn color pill there is. Blue, red, purple, black, white. Uh, there's even a clear pill. That's what, what's his name? Curtis Yarwin wrote. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. It seems like it's a land grab. Like someone, someone like staked out the land that's red on pills. And then like, there was like a land grab for every other color that you could on the pill territory. Um, which is, so we should talk about the next topic that we have, I think kind of plays into some of this. Um, mm -hmm. I put down rightness and I meant it on the political spectrum, but I also think that I also think you can make an interesting connection between like correctness, which is sort of what we've been discussing. Um, so like, I think that liberals kind of had made a big, big mistake in letting the conservatives call themselves the right. Um, because I think some people when they like, yes, I am right. I am a rightist. Like I am correct. And they mean it in the sense that like, I am correct. I am on the correct party. <laughs> I am the right party. Like, how can you argue with rightism? Because we are clearly right. Never mind the fact that, you know, someone at some point drew a spectrum and was like left and right. I don't, oh, there's I think actually a story there. It's not spectrum of right to left. It comes out of the convention in the British parliament of whether a particular political party sat on the right or the left of the oh. king. So it's like literally physical layout in the British Parliament building. So it has absolutely nothing to do with political views, just like seating arrangements. So that's kind of hilarious. But yeah, do you run into that a lot though? That uh, people sort of uh, conflate rightness in an epistemic sense with rightness in no, political sense? No, I've never heard of anyone. But if I was a right person, I don't think I would let anyone tell me that I was wrong, if that makes sense. Like, um, because you are like, yeah, I am of the right. Like, that is the right way to be. Um, I think, anyways, I think it was a mistake, a serious mistake that the left did. Not that they had any say in it, but they should definitely attempt to take rightness back from the right, I think, would be my suggestion as a political strategist. Um, I mean, they've tried that, haven't they? Like, they keep claiming to be the party of science, but then most of them are not, like, truly scientific-minded, as in they're, like, they're more of the... I fucking love science um, group where they don't quite get it. They go on like uh, marches saying we believe in science, but then you yeah. actually ask them, they're like kind of the worst sloppiest thinkers around. And this is like across the spectrum. Anybody who's like strongly political tends to be a sloppy thinker scientifically because yeah. science, if you actually are scientific, you realize that it's very messy. It doesn't neatly sort of support one side or the other. Like sometimes it supports one side partly, but with like a footnote that supports the other side. And it's like, it's not satisfying, especially at the level of like political and social claims. It never satisfyingly leads to one side being quote unquote right. Right. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I would disagree with you that um, the left um, sort of uh, is damaged by not being quote unquote the right party. I think the spectrum is equally damaging to both because um, mm -hmm. you've got this, um, I don't know, n-dimensional sort of uh, space of beliefs and it all gets projected down into one dimension and it hurts everybody who is forced to sort of uh, live within that scheme for electoral reasons. And uh, I think it happens because in a large democracy, like one bit of information is like the maximum like 300 million people can hold in their head at any time. It's like, I, I don't have time for this. My attention will devote one bit of processing to deciding who to vote for. So it I ends up being that, that simple. I think that people hold, I think, okay, let's say that everyone holds one bit in their head, but it's all a different bit. Maybe that's what you're saying. But I think that like the things that people care about are all different depending on where they are. I actually like, I actually have an interesting, so this is like, in terms of what people care about and like the difference. So actually like my, we kind of like, I guess sort of bend this a little bit and talk a little bit more about political parties and rightness necessarily. Um, one thing that I've like, hang on, let me, this thing's like buzzing. Hopefully I don't remember. Okay. Um, one thing that I've been thinking about lately or like something that I think I've observed is that the contract that the 
right wing supporters of the right wing representatives in the government, I feel like they have a different contract or understanding with the representatives than the left party does. And I think that that kind of comes down to like, like anytime you do a favor for someone, you expect them to do a favor back for you. So it's kind of this tit for tat thing. And I think that right wing voters, um, a right sided voters tend to have a tit for tat expectation of their politicians and that they have a very clear understanding of what they are expecting to get from voting for that person. Whereas I think that leftist voters don't have a tit for tat relationship so much with their with their um, representatives. I think it's more of a moral and value based understanding mm -hmm that I vote for this person because they represent my values instead of I vote for this person because of what we have a contract that they're going to do for me. Um, and I think that that voting style makes it harder to understand why the different parties support the things that they do. Um, the other thing that, I don't know, well, this is kind of a separate thing, but it was more about like understanding why we're never going to get money out of politics. Um, because every representative that you send to the House of Represent of like to the House or the Congress, their their sole mission, their incentive is to get whatever they can for the people that voted for them. So they're like they they're trying to get the tat for the tit that was sending them mm -hmm. there. Like, um, and so anything they have to do what they have to do to deliver what they promised their constituents they would do, especially like the right the right wing party, I think. So, um I think you're sort of um, roughly right but there's like a few like e enough weakness that i want to try and steel man your argument a little bit or steel woman <laughs> you should um, look into the genders of these things uh, but uh, i, I do think both sides steel man, hmm? so you guys can keep you guys can keep the steel men like <laughs> it's fine ah. do yours keep it Sorry. Um, Ramen too, they're all yours. I, I was uh, making a joke about that. I, I'm fine with keeping um, sort of idiomatic expressions unless they're like really awful. Uh, we should talk about that at some point. Like there's this whole movement um, for changing vocabulary in computer science about blacklist versus whitelist and things like that. Mm -hmm. But we, we'll talk about that another time. But yeah, this thing. So uh, for one thing, I think um, what you're talking about applies to both sides. Like for example, in many specific things, both right and left, Congress uh, people have like contracts as in we'll bring jobs to the district. If a big defense contract comes up, we'll try to get the factory built here. Um, but yeah, I, I would say I would, uh, so it could be that, you know, if it's a more military kind of like um, earmarking kind of thing, it's more right wing because defense factories tend to be run and people who work in them tend to be, you know, more right wing. But on the other hand, there's also big social programs and stuff. So the jobs creation for that might happen in like blue districts. But that said, I think there's a sort of a germ of truth to what you're saying about values-based voting being less friendly to this kind of very transactional relationship um, with your representatives. And I think that actually speaks to a deeper thing. Like it's not that the right doesn't have values, but their values are like traditional and very concretely tied to existing institutions. I mean, that's why they're called conservatives, right? So take something like um, abortion rights, right? So that comes from like, Christian belief systems, uh, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, it's a very specific thing. You can very concretely go and try and get Roe v. Wade uh, turned over. You can very concretely go and like do things about clinics and stuff. Whereas the typical kind of thing that um, the left wants, like say um, climate action, it's this sort of ambiguous, amorphous, whole new thing that has no existing big institutions, doesn't come from the Christian church. And you can't actually, you don't even know what to ask for because it's too deep an expertise area, right? So if you end up asking, you'll end up asking the politicians for banned plastic straws and it, that ends in like really stupid directions. So the smart people on the left tend not to ask specific things because they know it's like new stuff that they, that's why they're progressives. They want new stuff. So it's mm -hmm. too new and they can't actually, they don't know what specific things to ask for. So they hope that they can elect people who are like wise enough and sort of sincere enough that they'll actually do the hard work of thinking it through and figuring out what the right things to do are. So they tend to be disappointed because politicians across the spectrum aren't known for their, um, you know, deep 
um, attention span where something like climate action that takes decades of like serious thinking, you have to kind of yeah. stick to it. You have to get reelected to Congress like several terms. They would slowly push an agenda. And there are uh, senators and uh, Congress people who do that. Like they make a policy expertise in an area and over like 10, 20 year career in politics, they will slowly push that agenda forward. But that's like so rare. These people like seem like alien angels or something, right? So in general, well, I think- like the yeah. left wants the philosopher kings, right? We're trying to elect philosopher kings who can yeah. execute the policy. And getting disappointed. Them. You're trying to elect philosopher kings and getting disappointed. And on the right, typically you have such low expectations you'll take Trump and end up in a transactional deal with him on really- Yeah, and this is why Trump was so focused on the stock market is because that was the contract that he made with his populace or the people that voted him in is like, we're going to bring the stock market back. And that is like, and that is like the thing that his constituents understood that they were voting for when they voted for him. So that's why, I think that's why he's so obsessed with it is because it is like the thing that they made the contract on, if that makes sense. For yeah, some part, at least reason. one of his constituencies, the rich part of his constituencies were like business owners and stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I think the you know, tough part for the left is they end up defaulting to that anyway. So it's like, it's not that they're worse than the right, but they start out claiming to be better and then they end up being about the same, right? Like, it's not like the left um, candidates end up doing anything different. So they will also end up like basically doing what the Wall Street bosses want them to do. Like Biden, Clinton, all of them have the similar track record of kind of being in a transactional uh, deal yeah. with Wall Street rich people. And they'll do the same thing, except since they originally promised to do much more, it feels like a letdown and disappointment. And then the right also gets to accuse them of hypocrisy of like, it's like, haha, you promised big ideals and then you failed and you're like this, Craven, just like me. But then everybody forgets the fact that these people never even went as far as promising good things. They're like, right. we promise you this corruption to continue. And it's, and the irony is that on the right, it's like they think the sin is being hypocritical about wanting to be good, and they mm. think actually just openly being bad is better than trying to be good and failing. So something like that is going on where they they kind of assume the moral high ground based on never trying to be good in the first place. So there's, yes. uh, that's, I think, fundamentally why I end up, uh, even, I'm, I wouldn't consider myself an idealist, but I do think if you're sort of a, I don't know, pragmatic person who understands how politics and the economy works, you can try and like in the chaos of like Darwinian, whatever, you can try to basically push in small ways for things to get slightly better every year, right? You can't get utopia in a year, but you can like push for a 1% change. And if you're not even promising to do that and you're so cynical that you're gonna like transact um, on like, I don't know, I'm gonna stop teaching evolution and bring back creationism in schools and you're completely cynical about it. It's not that you believe that, it's like you're willing to trade children's education for those political points, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, there must be sincere creationists out there, but I think 80% of people claiming to believe in creationism it's just like political favor trading or something like that. Anyway, that was my little rant on rightness. Some of that is like a control. I think some of the like the congregationism stuff is a little bit of a control impulse um, in that like you want to see your values reflected in your government. Um, but like the, uh, what do you call it? Or like not have other people's values pushed on your children via like the whatever. Yep. You know? Um, I want to just point out that like kind of what you're describing with that, how the the left puts forward its best and ends up with like about average, um, like that, isn't that kind of like where you get that resentment from? Like the, it's like the, maybe it's not, you didn't have it and then you don't, but it's like you were promised it and you didn't get it. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That, that could be it. Um, <laughs> Do I have to think through the details of that particular thing? So I, I think of what you promised, sorry, and didn't get more in sort of a cultural contract way than a political contract. It's not politicians promising you jobs or whatever. It's your entire generation being promised a certain lifestyle based on being raised a certain way by your parents. And uh, uh, I guess blue coastal liberal parents raised their kids a particular way in the 90s which led to them having certain expectations that were let down. 
So indirectly, maybe two or three degrees removed from say the Clinton years, there was a relationship like there was a booming internet economy and Clinton was the president there mm. with surpluses. People thought the world would be great. They raised their children in a particular way under that expectation. And then that world fell apart. And then you have this generation of kids with recent, uh, well, you, you guys are not kids anymore. You're in your late thirties to early forties, but you know, a, a young new generation with a lot of resentment. And whereas Gen Z, I think is that's the dis- dividing line between Gen Z and millennials. Like Gen Z didn't even get raised to believe in a positive future. Like there was nothing yeah. to be let down, which is why they're turning conservative, by the way. I think Gen Z is a significantly so more, much conservative. more conservative. They are so yep. conservative, not to like, but yes, they are so conservative. It's like my, my impression of Gen Zers is like, wow, you guys are conservatives and proud of it and really happy to be conservatives. Like, you know, sort of, I don't even think they realize, I don't know how self-aware they are. That's an open question, but. Um, I think the mistake uh, sort of, cultural sophistication for self-awareness. Like if you look at um, uh, Gen Z memes on Instagram, there's this thing called Politigram. They're like very weird memes, like uh, that Gen X and millennials have a hard time parsing. But it's like, yeah, it's weird. And there's like six levels of weird references and shit going on in your memes. But that doesn't actually mean you're self-aware. It just means you're like young and clever, right? Um, but, But they're not conservative in the sense of like, Trump voters who lost their jobs in the 80s being conservative. They're more like, they're trad, they are um, sort of um, economically risk averse. So it's a bunch of other traits. They're more like the depression generation, the silent generation, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a lot of Gen Z friends? I have no idea. I don't know, Ben Cat. On, well, on Twitter, you can't tell. I, I know I have a few Gen Z friends on Twitter who've like, self-classified as Gen Z. Hmm. But, but uh, I think mine is definitely not a random sample. Like people who kind of want to read my tweets and interact with me are not typical Gen Z. <laughs> Let me put it that way. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I think I kind of hang out in some places where there's a lot of Gen Z people on the internet. Um, I, I, I think we were talking about things. this before um, in relation to the whole premium mediocre versus domestic cozy thing. And mm. um, you were saying that you kind of like get the domestic cozy vibe and uh, you you fit into those spaces well. So you're kind of like transitional that way, right? So you're somewhere between millennial and Gen Z. I do think I made the transition from millennial to, gen, to, to kind of like hanging out with Gen Z. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause like I get, I think like I get most of their meat. Like I think I understand. I think I probably understand them better than most people who don't spend time in those places on the internet. But yeah, yeah. Like TikTok and the like. Actually, it's not that I don't understand it. It's like I'm bored by most Gen Z memes. Like the. I lips, I think uh, yeah. it is what is it? Uh, it is meme, right? Did you see that one? Yeah. Yeah, that one is like, I saw it. I kind of saw where it came from, but, and I kind of got it, but it was like, this isn't fun for me. This isn't interesting. It isn't yeah. creating like a, you know, thought space that's uh, entertaining or. Right. But I think, yeah. I, I think about, I think I can get, so I think it was also kind of plays into the next topic. I think we've sort of been on the next topic for a while, sort of, oh, but okay. in like, very abstract way um uh but we'll get there in a sec but what i wanted to say about um something about gen z memes i think is that there there are like there's a certain level of cleverness that's interesting in them but they are lacking like that repelliness they lack like the deep insightiness that you come to want and expect i think maybe as we get older and more wise you're just like this is like there's nothing like deep and like good gold there's no gold here like there's no like yeah there's no like sudden revelation or new way of seeing the world that like is going to move you forward so it's kind of like it um 
what do you call it? At Refactor Camp last year, there was this amazing presentation by Moritz and his friend. I can't remember. There were two Anders, guys. yeah. Anders, um, the Xeno reaction one, yeah. Yeah. I felt that was such a great, like, um, encapsulation of, like, all of the brilliance and yet also kind of, like, missing the deepness that is a lot of the Gen Z meme memeology. And then it's, like, this really great and kind of interesting and hilarious, like, like performance piece um but when you dig into what they're trying to say and like get to like the actual there's no meat there it's just like a it's a performance <laughs> and it's like a play and it's an amazing hilarious like fun like kind of fantasy put together that touches all the things and like it's almost like um you know how like ai will like they they're like like they do like these yes. images that the ai created and you look at them like oh wow that looks like three dogs in a cloud like um, you're like, oh, wow, how do I recognize that it's a cloud? And you realize that, like, the AI is just, like, throwing up things that, like, is a Rorschach test for humans, right? Like, it hasn't actually, like, hit upon anything. It's just figured out, like, what things to show up such that certain circuits in your brain activate. It's like, oh, I don't know. I think you're saying a whole bunch of things there. So let me see if I can kind of, like, um, separate and enumerate them. Uh, starting with the last thing, the... Yeah, uh, Moritz and Anders, I think both are on, I think they're Gen Z. Like I met Moritz in oh, yeah. uh, 2015. Um, yeah, so they're young. So they're on the younger side. Um, um, yeah, they're Gen Z, definitely. Uh, so I think uh, in that particular case, I think there is more depth to what's going on because I kind of know a little bit about both of them and where that stuff is coming from. So there's like projects and crypto stuff that they've both been into. So there's yeah. probably more there, but you're right in general about that vibe of that presentation and Gen Z yeah. culture in general. And I think there's a few things going on. One is, as you mentioned, they're simply young. Like to have like, I don't know, gold and insight there, you kind of have it, have to have it be about something. And for that, you have to have a certain amount of life experience. Like millennials, the oldest millennials were already in the workforce and had several years working experience by the time the recession um, hit, uh, right? So um, yeah, I think that's true, yeah. So, the, so they had like life experience to sort of refer to and use as fodder for their meme production. So there was like input that was actually life experience. Whereas Gen Z, a lot of it is observation. They've seen their elder siblings struggle. They've seen their parents struggle through the last decade, but they themselves have been like maybe 14, 15, 16, right? They've been playing Minecraft and YouTube. So it's, I don't want to like um, sort of uh, dismiss their take because of that, but it's like indirect spectator input it's rather like than direct. Observational input. comedy, maybe. If it's comedy, it's observational culture production, let's say. Uh, but on the other hand, I think they also kind of don't care for it that much. Like um, they've already sort of uh, foreclosed on the future in a certain way. It's like mm. um, you only care about producing like deeper insight from a meme if you actually have something to lose and care about something that you might want to lose. So satire is that kind of thing, right? So a satire comes out of like um, disillusionment from idealism or something like that. It's like, you believed in something and then you got red pilled, it fell apart, and then you turned to satire and comedy. So that's a loss based cultural production. Whereas Gen Z, I can imagine like an 18 year old looking at the world in flames and saying, there's nothing here for, for me. I have been promised nothing and there is nothing out there for me. So you can't even generate cynicism. Like there's, there are no expectations to undermine. So in that sense, it's not a function of not having lived life. In that sense, it's a function of not expecting to have a life at all. So it's like pre, pre-destroyed life. But I don't think that like that, I don't, uh, yeah. I mean, I can see why you say that to some extent, but like, I also think that there are institutions that exist for Gen Z that didn't exist for us, like influencers as like, like, so you could hope to like hit it big in the like influencing scene, right? Like there, I think there's still like, I think there's still like hope, but a lot of it is kind of wrapped up into the online institutions that we've built more than like anything else. Yeah. I mean, if you were millennial, you could have become big as a blogger or a podcaster. And if you were Gen Z, you could have become an, you know, TikTok influencer or um, YouTube celeb. So Instagram, I think is more millennial than um, TikTok, but yeah, but yeah, you still can. You're like a Twitch streamer or like get big by like growing an audience online. So like a lot of your like, a lot of your hope for um, hope for growth comes from your peer group sort of to an extent. Yeah. And I think Gen Z is 
extremely mercenary about that. Like when I read about um, YouTube stars or TikTok stars and how they join together and like, you know, rent big houses in LA and live like six or seven of them together and they're constantly streaming or twitching or something. And you hear them being interviewed and stuff. And it's like kind of sad it's both impressive and sad. Impressive part is they've like built up this huge hustle that's making them like tens of thousands of dollars a month. And I'm like, wow, okay, I can't do that after like this long. But on the other hand, it's like, really, is this all you want to get out of life? Like figure out the one button to push and like frantically push it for like several years and make money while you can. It's like, uh, and they're really good at it. They're like really good at like, developing and deploying this influence but there's like nothing there it's like they figured out how to like um, game a slot machine somehow and it's like paying out to them and yeah only a minority are like this but they are the i think idols and aspirational yeah. figures for their peers yeah. right so all of them want to be youtube stars not all of them but i think it's like <laughs> a it's a not unreasonable thing to hope for right yeah um, it's better than wanting a job or wanting to go to college because those seem like trashy options right now Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, yeah, anyways, they have some things to be cynical of. If not now, maybe later. Um, we're kind of running out of time, I think. We had two other things to talk about. Return on investment was the one that I was like hinting at that I feel like- All right. Oh, okay. Let's, about, let's like, do that. Yeah. Um, some, like, and I, I, wanted, I think that like we've already kind of talked about this in terms of like what return you expect when you vote for a politician is different. So the return on your vote being an investment um, I think that the right kind of has more of a, um, of a, sorry, my dog, um, has more of a, um, a return on investment contract. Like they know what to expect as a return more so, like concretely more so than the left. And then, um, I think Gen Z does have like this sort of, um, I think they do have a, an understanding of what return they expect on their investment in memes and the like to an extent like the meme production. Yeah, skills. it's very concrete. I think they understand uh, what that gets them. I think they expect money in the time frame of like one to three years. Like and influence, yeah. Yeah, and they're thinking about they it like- They understand influence, like- Yeah, uh, but, but that's, that's the limit of it. Like, I think uh, older generations have levels and levels of like um, concrete to vague kind of investments and expectations of return, right? Like um, you invest money in the stock market and you expect a certain rate of return. You invest effort into a job, you expect a paycheck, you know, I mean, so there's like levels you've been trained to, maybe not, maybe you don't expect much, but you're, you're in that expectations equation, all the way up to the world will be a better place kind of expectation from voting from, for Obama, right? Like hope was the ROI on Obama votes. Yeah, it was. Right? Yeah. And if you look at uh, the 1950s, uh, which uh, people like Peter Thiel love, um, the, uh, you hear the phrase, I was promised um, flying cars and I got 140 characters, right? So there's an element of like uh, return of investment expectation at the level of grand narratives. Like this is not money you're investing. It's not like effort. It's just literal cultural investment of belief. Like I yeah. believe in this narrative that's been spun for me and therefore I will expect flying cars. And if I don't get it, I'm going to be resentful and angry about it. So mm -hmm. the, I think if you go back, okay, here's a hypothesis. You go back one generation at a time and you will notice that each preceding generation had one more higher level of expectation of the future. So mm. like boomers had an expectation of like a great planet where the environment was sustainable, blah, blah, blah. Gen Z lost that kind of like, civilizational idealism and expectation. So we expect- You mean Gen X? Hmm? You mean Gen X? Yeah, Gen X, us, okay. so me, uh, not you. Yeah, yeah. Right, so we lost that civilizational expectation, but we kind of still retained expectations of like uh, civilizational stability, as in if we study and even if civically get a job, we can you know, stay employed and not end up on the street. So there was that kind of like very pragmatic mercenary investment in a career so career investment went from idealistic to mercenary it's like i know i can make a living kind of attitude and then by mm -hmm. millennial time the expectation of like you know education in career out that roi had broken down almost yeah, no. you don't think so i was gonna say yeah i don't think there was a direct line between education and job 
so much. Again, this may be a unique Texas experience because throughout the, I think between 2003 to the next decade or so, like a third to half of graduating um, seniors from college uh, couldn't find jobs or something and they ended up in their parents' basement. So they were disappointed in their education. I don't think, yeah, I think that like some, I, friends in my, um, I knew of people in the liberal arts school that had a lot harder time with it and ended up kind of like weird places. My friends that did like engineering and stuff ended up in like oil industry are getting like kind of burned out. All of my business school friends ended up a little burned out on this. Well, not all of them. Some of them are still doing consulting and went in to work for like McKinsey's and Accenture's and are either still working there or have moved on to other things. Yeah, um, but that's, I mean, that's been the whole debate, right? Like STEM versus liberal arts. It's not 50-50. Vastly more people go in for liberal arts and humanities degrees than STEM degrees, partly because it's just harder uh, partly because um, at 18, a lot more people are interested in kind of like artistic, social kind of stuff and fewer people are interested in STEMI things. I don't so, know, man. I mean, I like, I went to business school though and business school is like neither, it's not. It's, it's practical, art, yeah. And it's not engineering. It's like not either of that. There's like, there's more to the spectrum than just liberal arts or engineers yeah. though. I feel like you talk to people in SP and they want you to think it's one or the other, but like, there's this whole third leg that's like the business school that no one ever, ever talks about. Um, a lot of them are like my successful like friends there are all moving to the valley to work in jobs on the other side of tech stuff, like in tech, but not on the engineer, on not the as engineers tech, yeah. as like the money. Yeah, business people. school is kind of interesting, especially at the undergrad level, because when I think business school, I think MBA and grad level. So at yeah, the undergrad true. level, I don't know, it sounds like people trying to hedge their bets between a liberal education and a vocational one, right? Because um, it's not vocational in the sense of like um, uh, machine tools and welding and stuff, but it's vocational in the sense of you're learning something that is directly capable of plugging into the economy as a, oh, yeah. a practical skill. So it's like- Yeah, like you're to gonna go be a, an investment banker or an accountant. Yeah. Or a, yeah, yeah, but it is kind of like the white collar trade school. Exactly. So people who go in there, I think are probably uh, an interesting minority. They're like trying to hedge their bets in a particular way. And yeah, I mean, you're not typical of college students I've met. Like uh, you ended up on a very unusual path, I think. Yeah. I don't actually run, I don't, I don't know what my expectations were of coming out of I don't know that's a hard question I don't know I don't know it's like did I have expectations I I wanted to like start a business I went to business school because I wanted to run a business I didn't actually realize what business school was I just thought that's what you did I don't know dude I like <laughs> oh, that's so funny um yeah I am kind of naive though so it's okay that's the kind of person who does the biggest kinds of things because they don't know it can't be done. No idea what you're getting into. It's great. Um, <laughs> speaking of things, not knowing what you're getting into. Um, <laughs> should I tell my, should I tell my story about what I was up to this weekend? I can't decide. Oh decide? yes. Our last, our topic is repair, right? So from business school, you became a computer hacker and now a general hacker who builds Faraday cages and Bitcoin yeah. mining machines and stuff. And now you're getting into, well, my turf. I'm a mechanical engineer, but I've never oh, fixed a car in my life. And I've done like tiny minor repairs, but like, you know, replace wipers and things like that. Oh, but yeah. um, I, I, I've never really tinkered with cars, but you are now trying to fix a car that's broken down. So what's the story there? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, well, so two weeks ago, I decided I wanted to buy a car. Um, but not just any car. I've been borrowing a family car and the family car I'm borrowing, like the AC stopped working and I got stuck in traffic for two and a half hours. So I had a lot of time to think about my life choices while I was stuck in traffic on a Saturday for three hours in like the middle of, it was actually, it was still June. So he wasn't like really terrible yet. It was just in like the low nineties. Um, so it's just like totally okay. Um, but, uh, with no AC, so it's hot air blowing on your face. Um, and I decided I was going to buy myself a car that had a working AC. And um, like, <laughs> I realized that I wanted to get a used car. So I ended up buying an old, so I found, so I've been on Craigslist. I found one I wanted. 
I sent a mechanic out to check it. The guy who's selling it's great. He seemed like he was really he like he like you could just tell he like really loved the car and like knew what was what it needed done and like so he was really good. I get it. I drive it home. I don't drive it straight home. I drive it straight to the grocery store because I want to see how many groceries I can fit in the trunk. And um I don't know. I was really excited. Take it to do my favorite <laughs> chore was going to the grocery store with my new car. It's only a few blocks from where it's like really close to where I live. I usually walk over, so it's not like I was super far from home. I you know I go shopping, I get out, hop into the car, and can't get it started. <laughs> this brand car that I've like just bought. Um, so you know, I like it's hot out. It's like real hot. Where it's been sitting in the sun, and so I've got all these groceries I just bought. So I had to call a lift to take me home, um, and then went back. And of course, it started right up. I got it home so my dad you know my dad comes up I call my dad he's like you know he comes over he's like oh well we should like go get the battery checked so we take it over there and they're like yeah you need a new battery and I'm like I don't okay fine let's get a new battery so we get a new battery I don't think that was the problem that wasn't the problem well it wasn't the problem anyways the car's broken something's up with the car I took it to the plant store the next day to like buy some new plants for the front and it like wouldn't start when I tried to come home um so I had a friend here in town who was nice enough to come up and try and help me figure it out. And thought we figured it out. Finally got the car started, started driving it home. It died on the, like died on the road on the way home. I had to get some people to like push me into a, a parking lot and then called AAA and they towed me. I was like not even a mile from my house. Like this was a short drive. I was like not going that far with this thing. It was not pushing my luck that hard. But anyways, um, yeah, but we think we, we think we know what the problem is. But yeah, I bought some mechanic books. I'm going to learn how to fix it up. I'm looking at how to like trade out like the fuel filter needs probably going to like replace the fuel filter and I need to do the timing belt in the next month or two. And like there's, um, uh, what do you call it? There's like a, there's a leak in the engine at the back on like one of the O-rings. I'm going to take it out and put in a new O-ring, I think. So just listening to you exhausts me. <laughs> the what? Just listening to you exhausts me. Like, uh, this is the reason I basically never buy fixer-upper anything. So it's like the newest, most robust thing I can that uh, hopefully yeah. will require little to no maintenance. But this seems like most people, because like my friends are like, oh, Lisa, you're getting a used car. I'm like, it'll be fine. And like, you know, it falls apart in the first 24 hours, like not even the first hour of owning it. I'm having problems. And they're like, Lisa, what the fuck? I'm like, no, no, it's fine. We'll fix it. It won't be a big deal. But did you get a good deal on this car at least? It, it was What was it you said? 16 years old or something? Yeah, it's a 2004. And how many miles does it have on it? It has less than 100,000 miles. It has 99,000 oh, okay. miles. Yeah. Okay. It's, so, like, it's like, it's right. real good. It's real pretty. It's real pretty. It's got some scratches that we need to fix up, but it's nice. Okay. So it's, well, you can think of it as like a cheap um, investment with a return on investment of you learning car hacking skills, right? Basically, yeah. yeah. And like the nice thing, it's a Mazda Miata. The nice thing about that is they have a huge like community of people who are like big Mazda fans and like so finding parts for them is really easy and there's tons of online like how to do X, how to do Y, how to like troubleshoot Z. Um, Does it, is it one of the Mazdas that has a Wankel engine? A what? Oh, so you should look into this. So um, I, I'm not sure which models have this. But most uh, car engines are uh, built on like the regular piston cylinder, right? Like it's a tube-like cylinder and the piston goes in and out. Yeah. Mazda is, I think, the only car company in the world that makes um, cars based on what are known as Wankel engines, W-A-N-K-E-L. And this has a very weird kind of like uh, piston chamber that looks like a figure eight. And inside it, you've got like a triangle-shaped piston that rotates in a weird way. So it's um, hmm. the triangle is what's known as a Rolo triangle. It's like uh, if you've ever seen British coins, it's it's like a triangle with like rounded stuff. So it can mm -hmm. roll like a circle. So that's a Wankel engine. And I think the Miata, I don't know if it's the Miata, but um, definitely several Mazda models have Wankel engines. And Wankel engines are like kind of more powerful, but they overheat easily and they have leaking problems. So if you have a Wankel engine, you're going to learn some very weird fixing skills. I don't know. I don't think it's a Wankel engine. Oh, okay. I'm pretty sure it's not. I'm pretty sure it's a normal piston up down. Oh, okay. It's got like fan right. trapped and stuff. For a minute, so the there, I was excited that you'd be able to show us photos of a Wankel engine later. <laughs> no, I don't think that, not this cart at any rate. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. So you're going to learn 
car fixing stuff. Yeah, I think the yeah. reason I don't like repair stuff is the same reason I don't like debugging in uh, sort of like you know serious production programming, which is there's no correlation between sort of the seriousness of um, how something breaks that you have to debug, the seriousness of the solution, like why it broke and the consequence of it being broken, right? So it could be like a, there's a bug in a program and it results in really weird behavior and then you spend 10 hours and you discover it's a misplaced comma and mm -hmm. all of that goes on and this 10 hour invest, investment in like a really frustrating thing, the psychological payoff is annoying, but the actual problem it causes in practice could be it's losing you millions of dollars a minute because it's some production server or it kind of doesn't matter. So you don't even know what this misplaced comma that took you 10 hours to figure out whether it's return on investment is going to be, uh, you know, millions of dollars worth of like downtime uh, averted or like this is like crappy thing I shouldn't have bothered to fix and thrown away. So you don't know. It's like very uh, to connect it to quantum stuff. Bugs are like, you know, quantum ROI, like you don't really know how much the effort will go in and what the rewards are gonna be easily. And repair is not as bad, like mechanical things I think are less weird because there's physics intuition you can apply. But the same thing, it's like you spend 20, 30 hours trying to figure out some complicated, you know, troubleshooting mechanical problem and then you figure out it's this one nut that has to be tightened a little bit and then the whole thing goes away. And the worst part is, in the process of fixing it, you might spend a shit ton of money you didn't need to. Like you just bought a battery that you may not have needed to. I remember one, um, my wife's laptop, uh, this was a Sony about uh, 15 years ago, it kind of stopped working. We took it to Best Buy, they didn't know what, what to do. Then they sent it to the you know, fixing, like, you know, back end fixing shop. They came back with, you have to replace the motherboard for 900 bucks. I was like, screw that, I'm buying a new laptop for that. But just on sort of, um, hunch, I took the laptop into my lab at Cornell. I, I was doing theory and simulations. I was not doing hands-on hardware work, but a friend of mine was doing like hardware building for like the robotics lab. He said, yeah, I'll take a look at it. And it was just a single um, uh, lead to the uh, power circuitry, the power management circuitry from the battery pack that had come loose. So it took like mm. a minute and, you know, a penny's worth of solder to fix it. And I was like, if I had made the mistake of saying yes to what Best Buy offered, I would have spent a thousand dollars to fix this like penny worth of thing. And just because my friend kind of knew what the right thing to fix was, I just happened to get it fixed. But otherwise it would have been this really expensive thing. So those but are I the think, things that annoy me about repair. Yeah, but I think the point that you're, I think the broader point you're making here and you don't realize you're making is that expertise is like, is the real like um, hack for doing repair work. Because like if you have the expertise to understand the system and know like kind of where those problems are coming from, then the amount of time and effort and energy and like money you spend on it is like very low. Whereas if you're like a complete noob and you have no idea what the fuck you're doing, you end up buying new batteries or like replacing the motherboard because you have no way of figuring out, you have no way of like ascertaining, you have no way of like understanding the system well enough to like know where the problem might be coming from. So like, yeah, repairs are really expensive and costly and take a lot of time in those situations. Well, I think they take a lot of time and expense, even if you're an expert, because you're not counting the cost of acquiring that expertise. Like this is not an efficient learning curve. Like that's what frustrates yeah. me. I think I'm a good learner in a textbook sense. Like I can at least used to be, not now, but in like high school and college, I was a very good student in sort of study for the test way. Like I could take any subject, rip through the exercises and homework and uh, like get good grades. I was good at that thing. It's that learning curve is very efficient. Like the learning curve for trigonometry is very efficient. You buy a trigonometry book, work through 300 uh, trigonometry problems and you're good at it, right? Whereas the learning curve for say hardware repairs and hacking and troubleshooting ground loops and loose wires and crap, it's like insanely slow. Like I tried it for like a year when I was working in a lab and I decided hardware stuff is not for me. It's just oh, way too slow, right? I see what you mean. Yeah, because even at my current job, I've been on my current job for a year and a half and I finally feel like I'm starting to get up to speed and like, I've been doing software for like half a decade before this. So like, I'm not new to software. I'm just new to the tech stack, but it just really does take that long to like get to be an expert in the system. And it's not so like- this is lightning no network stuff, right? Exercises you can do, huh? 
this is lightning now lightning network stuff yeah lightning stuff but it's not just the light so lightning stuff is like i would put the lightning network stuff itself like as like yeah that's kind of like study, studying for trigonometry there's like a layout and like you can go read the stuff and study it and like learn it but like the stuff that's been slowing me down is learning c and like learning all of the tool sets for c and how to debug c and where to find problems and enough of understanding the code base that i'm working in to like know where all the things are it's like learning it's system learning it's learning a system and it's learning how all the parts are connected in the system it takes a long time and it's like something about like programming in a new language like you're is kind of like learning a new language like you you have to hit a certain level of fluency where expressing new thoughts is like less effort like there's this point in time where expressing a new thought in a new language is like way lower cognitive overload than before okay so the learning curve you're saying is um, it's slow in the beginning but at some point you go through some sort of fluency yeah. cliff and okay. suddenly big things get much easier yeah, I yeah. think I don't have the patience to get to that fluency cliff point in most things. So um, I, I'm not lazy, I would say. There are things where I've like tried and acquired a certain amount of like slow fluency. But in general, I'm too impatient to put in the work for anything with a really slow learning curve. Yeah, so, have you ever, do you feel like you've ever gained fluency in a domain though? I mean, a lot of like conceptual domains a lot of math subjects uh, i've done it math is somewhere i think in between something like mechanical or electrical hacking versus something like uh, uh, i don't know history or something so there's like uh, it's in between in the sort of ease yeah. with which you can get to fluency whereas something like you know uh, learning to write and read uh, critical theory texts in the humanities so that's yeah. at the other extreme where it's like in a way super efficient because it's so cut off from any ground reality. You read a bunch of the books, you start to think in that language, you can write in that language. It's very quick if you have the um, sort of aptitude for it. Whereas something like hardware hacking, even if you have the aptitude for it and you're a genius, there's a certain slowness to it because you have like a feedback loop with physical things. Software is a little faster, math is even faster. And by the time you get to pure words, it's as fast as it can get. So uh, because I'm impatient, even though I started out as an engineer, I've gravitated towards like fluency with word stuff. So there's certain kinds of writing I've acquired that in. Uh, other than that, maybe I would say the only domain where I've acquired a certain amount of fluency is probably cooking. So the only like truly physical domain where I have some fluency is cooking. And small mechanical and electrical repairs, things like electronics and stuff now. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard. Uh, yeah, you seem to really love that stuff, and you I don't pick up think one I a love year. It, I just, I just know how to throw myself into things I know nothing about. Is like what I'm good at. Like that's that's my one thing I'm good at. I mean, but it's not enough to be good at it. You must enjoy it. Like uh, you're going to spend the next few months like digging into car engines and like just, I uh, just you're smiling and excited about it. See, like I would be like. <sighs> I'm not, I don't think it's going to be that hard though. I don't oh, it's not about it being hard. I agree. Like lots of these things are not hard, but it's just, huh. I would get dragged down by the tedium of it. Like I, I've done this stuff. I, I mean, like I said, I'm a mechanical engineer and I had to take like four classes of uh, shop class on electrical machinery and machine tools and all that stuff. Some of it was fun. You can kind of get into the zone of it. Other stuff is like, when am I going to get out of this class? Huh. Oh, maybe I've never done it. I don't have any of those, like, uh, what do you call it? Like, um, I don't have, it's a certain amount of naivety, right? Like, I don't know. I haven't hit any hard problems with, well. No, I, I don't think it's naivety. I think you're actually good at this and you have enough experience and you enjoy it. You're just not willing to admit you enjoy it. Like, you actually <laughs> enjoy mucking around with slow learning curves. I don't. I see. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. yeah maybe I think you I like slow learning curves. You, you do languages, you do hardware hacking, you do software hacking. You, you pick all these domains where the learning curves are really slow. Huh? I yeah, don't. I guess that's true. <laughs> but they're not, they don't stay slow. Hmm. I, I guess. guess I rarely get to that part. So I wouldn't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I, this feels like I'm entering the part where I can't talk about it. I, it's like it's funny because I feel like when we talked about programming, like I couldn't really say anything about programming. I feel like this is another area that like I just I can't say anything about it, which I think says something. I'm not sure what, but like I don't it have says, any. 
I mean, right. it means you're one of the enlightened ones and um, you can't actually convey, I don't know, the wisdom beyond that point to people like me who don't go there. Yeah, I don't know how to talk about them. Yeah, yep. I don't know. We'll just call you enlightened on matters of hacking and learning. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. No. Cool. Anyway, so we talked about repairs. Is that it? All yeah, I think that's it. I think we're way over on time. Oh, but... wow. Okay, yeah, it's 3.53. All we... right. But, um... Benkat, it's always a pleasure. Thanks for hanging out on Scarpia season. Always a pleasure, Lisa. So we'll talk about what is it? Our S next week. Oh, and we're going to have, have our, first, our first guest, which we're excited to announce next week. All right. Next week, we'll have a guest on the show. Nice. Right. Surprises right. for S. S for surprise. Um, cool. All right. Bye, then, Kat. Bye, Lisa. Scorpio Season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe. <laughs>